ವಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣೋರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಸೊ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತಾ ಥರ್ಟೀನ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ವಿ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಅ ನ್ಯೂ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಟುಡೇ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ a uh, new section of the bhagavad gita i uh, was saying that one way of looking at the bhagavad gita 18 chapters is to divide it into um three sections of six chapters each how that is done um so the great advaitic teaching mahavakya the great sentence tatvamasi you are that which is the basic the essential teaching of advaita vedanta you can look at the whole gita through that um, lens or through that prism it's one interpretation i'm not saying you have to do that but some teachers have done that like madhusudan saraswati very uh, notably so they say that the first six chapters are an inquiry into the nature of the i who am i that thou art you are that so the inquiry into the nature of you then we have um the next six chapters from 7 to 12 which which we just did um uh, there it is an inquiry into the nature of that that is that means god the god of religion in technical terms in vedanta saguna brahman ishwara or bhagavan or saguna brahman the creator preserver destroyer of the world you know the idea of god in theistic religions and then finally the last six chapters starting with 13 to 18 are supposed to be the identity of that and you you are that or i am that so the individual being and god are in other in sanskrit terms jivatma paramatma jivatma sentient sentient being individual sentient beings like us paramatma the supreme self or god and how they are one and the same um in what sense so the 13th chapter is crucial this is where um, the advaitic teachings are given a tremendous emphasis here and we're going to begin that chapter today see i have always said that advaita vedanta non dual vedanta to understand the identity of the sentient being and brahman of individual and god jiva and brahman one has to do it in two steps in two steps first of all bring out the distinction between the self and the not self what do you mean by that the self i you vedanta says we are suffering from a great delusion a great mix up we have mixed up what is the self with what is not the self and one must start there without starting there one cannot come to the a uh, final understanding of vedanta as this oneness you one with brahman so first we must distinguish the self from the not self and that involves understanding and seeing for ourselves how i am not what i thought i was i am the self is there but not what we thought it was we thought it was this body mind and we are will be led to see that we are it's not body mind you are this limitless awareness existence awareness sat chit prakasha another term is sat prakasha one, one of our senior swamis who founded the vedanta center in st louis sat prakasha ananda the term sat prakasha sat means being and prakasha means light what we are is being light is awareness uh, limitless existence awareness so that one we have to see ourselves that's a radical change in our understanding of ourselves so that's step one without that you cannot have i am that i am brahman you cannot come to that but that's not enough the second step will now have to be that um, um this entire universe is one reality that i am that pure consciousness and the entire universe is nothing but that pure consciousness these are two dis- different steps first you separate yourself from the self the self from the not self you are the witness consciousness and everything else is an object other than you separate from you so it's still duality duality means two or more things are there you are there and everything else is there and in the second step that everything else is absorbed back into you so that there is only one thing left 
divine identity, divine unity. Swami Vivekananda put it in this way. What is Vedanta? Two things. One is the divinity within us and in his language. The divinity within us and the second is the oneness of all existence. So we are the Atman, we are pure consciousness. Yes, that's step one. Second, that ekam eva dvitiyam, one alone without a second. It is that one ocean of existence, consciousness, bliss. We are not parts of that. We are that, literally. There are no part and whole. So these two steps have to be accomplished. And the beauty of the 13th chapter is in the first verse and the second verse, these two steps are accomplished. First verse, verse is step one and um, second verse is step two. Non-duality is established. Very, very important, very crucial chapter. Um, literally, the divinity within us, what we are truly, that is step one. And um, oneness of all existence, step two. So let's dive into it. Also, Shankaracharya has given great importance to this uh, chapter, especially the second verse. Um, Adi Shankaracharya, there are some crucial vers verses where Shankaracharya has, you know, he has written this commentary, Bhashyam, on the Bhagavad Gita, a commentary. He writes extensive commentaries on some of these verses. So, this is one of them. This is the verse, the second verse of the 13th chapter, which we will see today. Shankaracharya writes uh, his largest commentary, most extensive commentary in the whole Bhagavad Gita on that second verse. So, um, we will spend time on that. Somebody was saying, it's going too slowly, Swami. I said, just you wait. Because the second verse when we'll come to, we'll come to it today, but then we'll stop there. We'll stop there for three classes. I have attended a Gita course where it, uh, uh, don't look so uh, astonished, or oh, three classes for one verse. I attend a Gita, a Gita course where uh, I listened to these uh, Gita teachings where the teacher took 20 classes to explain that second verse. 20, literally, I'm not joking. 20. <laughs> uh, verse number one. Oh, by the way, one more point, interesting point, the 13th chapter. So there is, um, in some books, you will find an extra verse. Uh, so, I don't know if your books have it. Arjuna asks a question. It has it. Uh, so, in this book, I don't have it. And uh, Shankaracharya has not given any commentary to it. In some editions, you don't find it. It's possible that um, the 13th chapter begins with a question by Arjuna, but the question was introduced. It's just the topics in the 13th chapter strung together into a question. Yeah. And then Krishna starts. So, we'll start with Krishna's uh, teachings, verse 1 and 2. If you have that question then it will make it verse 2 and 3, what we'll study today. And even more confusingly, some editions have given that question, they've given it verse 0. <laughs> so the question is there, but it's not numbered, uh, it's not counted in these verses. You can chant after me. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha, Shri Bhagavan Uvacha, Idam Shariram Kaunteya, Idam shariram kanteya, kshetram ityabhidhiyate, kshetram ityabhidhiyate, etad yovetitam prahu, etad yovetitam prahu, kshetra gya iti tad vidaha, kshetra gya iti tad vidaha. So Krishna says to uh, Arjuna, if you are feeling Krishna didn't say that, but I'm just saying it in case <laughs> you're feeling warm or hot, you can switch on the fans if you're feeling that. Um, you, you're all right? Yeah, you're all right. Okay, okay so you're all right. Uh, and if somebody's got an empty seat next to you, you can raise your hand. There are some people who have just come. Yeah, there are two, three, three, four empty seats. So Krishna says to um, Arjuna, this body, O son of Kunti, this body, idam shariram, this body right here, it is called the field. Kshetra means field. It is called the field. Label it the field. Just call it the field. The one who experiences this. One who knows this. Who knows this? You from inside. We from inside. When we are experiencing this body. You the one who is experiencing this body from inside. You are called 
you are labeled Kshetragya, the knower of the field. Simple enough. Just very literal. This body, call it the field, and yourself, the knower of the field. Knower in the sense, you know it. Know it in the sense, you can see it, touch it, smell it, you know, hear it. If you're hungry, your tummy is rumbling. Um, so, every sense organ objectifies this body. And you have general sense of the body that we are here. Shankaracharya in his commentary will say that, um, Swabhava, naturally we are aware of, our, of the body. Or Opadesha, if somebody is pointed out, you know, in an anatomy class or something, it's pointed out in detail, this is the body. So we know the body. We are the knower of the field and the body is the field. So this, just this much is introduced. And the crucial word here is knows. Yo Veti, the one who knows this. What are we trying to do here? We're trying to understand who or what we are. We're trying to isolate the self from the not-self. In Sanskrit, atma from anatma, self from not-self. And why are we trying to do that? Of course, it's always useful to know who or what we truly are. But ultimately, the goal is to establish the Advaitic, the, the non-dual identity. You are Brahman. And that cannot be done without ascertaining what we are actually. All right. Now, the principle that is going to be used here to separate the self from the not-self, from who we are, from what we are, we are not, is the principle that the subject is different from the object. The knower is different from the known. The seer is different from the seen. And note, he starts with the body. Why does he start with the body? Here's the whole world out here. Now, we never confuse ourselves with the world. Here is a table, and I know the table. And I don't think that I am the table. Never. I even know my own clothes. But I never think that I am these clothes. But with the body, ah, problem starts. I know the body. There's no doubt about it. I am the knower of the body. But I also sort of feel I am the body. Or at least I feel the body is an integral part of whatever I am. The body is me. I am the body. I am this. This is me. I am this. Here. And what is this? It's I. It is I. It's me, you know, that old joke, I can't resist it. In the gates of heaven, I think St. Peter stands there, in the gates of heaven. And then somebody knocks and St. Peter asks, who's there? And he says, it is I. And St. Peter says, oh great, another English teacher. <laughs> so I am the knower and the body is the known. We do not have any problem with the world as such, in the sense that we do not confuse our, our, the self with the world. We think that the world is separate from it, that's very clear to me. But we confuse ourselves with the body. Uh, to the extent that if you say we are confusing ourselves with the body, some people might say it's not a confusion, it's a fact. I am the body, and the body is I. This is what I am. Vedanta, that the first, um, Swami Ranganathan used to call it thought bombs, Vedantic thought bombs. The first thought bomb Vedanta drops, a stunning revelation. It's, uh, you're not the body. You're not even the mind. That's what's going to come in this one verse. Very radical, strong, uh, powerful step forward in our spiritual life. Another thing, notice how this teaching is about here and now and you. Idam, here. Not there, heaven. No, no, no. Idam, here. And it's about you. It's about the body. It's an inquiry into who you are right now. It's not a question of believing this or that or performing this or that ritual or um, you know, meditating on this or that. No, 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 no. Just, just listen carefully and follow what is being shown here. That's all we are asked to do. Just listen carefully and try to get what is being shown. If we understand it, we'll also realize it. Why? Because uh, what we are going to understand is already present before us. It's I. I am present right here, right? If I understand something, it should be a fact right away. Now let's use uh, one of the available Vedantic methodologies to inquire into this, to develop this theme. Uh, my favorite is Drik Drishya Viveka, the seer and the seen, and it, it fits in very well here. What's the method? The method is the seer is different from the seen. We want to know what, or we, uh, what I am truly am, so let's use this methodology. I, the seer, am different from whatever I see. And uh, the teaching, this is from the text, little text called Drik Drishya Viveka. The first verse is what we will use to understand Krishna's teaching here. He who knows the field is the knower of the field. That's what we are trying to understand. The first verse of Drik Drishya Viveka 
he is um, um, rupam drishyam lochanam drik i'll translate everything don't worry rupam drishyam lochanam drik tad drishyam drik tu manasam drishyadhi vrittaya sakshi drigeva natu drishyate forms or colors or shapes are seen eyes are the seer okay so well note three things the eyes are different from what they see physically different you see uh, the, i can see the microphone microphone is physically different from the eyes which are seeing the microphone i can see all these people they're physically are separated from the eyes in fact the only thing that the eyes cannot see are the eyes themselves and don't say that have you tried looking into a mirror swami <laughs> have you heard of selfies swami no even if you look into a mirror you will see a reflection of your eyes even if you take a selfie you will take a picture of your eyes you will not see the eyes will not see themselves directly the way they see things you know straight away the eyes cannot turn into themselves and see operate on them so this is an old well known principle in philosophy that things don't operate on themselves self reflexivity is not allowed a knife cannot cut itself for example so the eyes are different from what they see um then the second thing note what the eyes see are many you see many colors many forms many shapes you see so many people here and you see so many colors and shapes here and chairs and tables and lights and so on and so forth there are so many things which are the seeing are many the seer is one not that we are one eyed one organ of vision the seer is one the seen are many third observation the seer remaining constant the seen cons- constant is changing all the time you saw something else outside now what you are seeing is constantly changing the eyes of course the eyes are also moving and changing but relatively stable the eyes remaining what they are they are able to see all these changes so three things put them together the seer and the seen are different the seer is one the seen are many and the seer is relatively unchanging and the seen are con- constantly changing it's a, just a general observation it's a, all right granted so what let's go deeper now focus on the eyes themselves focus on the eyes themselves consider the eyes note that the eyes are also seen quote unquote seen seen means experienced you feel that you have eyes you know that you have eyes you can um, know that eyes are open you can know that eyes are shut you can know that eyes are not seeing too well you need a um, you know go you need to go to an eye doctor so you know things about the eyes the eyes become an object to you to whom who is the seer of the eyes not the eyes themselves not the ears mind yes it's the mind which knows the various states of the eyes themselves i used to have 20 20 vision earlier now i can hardly you know see without glasses so <coughs> who knows that the mind the mind is the seer tad drishyam driktu manasam the mind is the seer the eyes are the seen now same three observations notice the mind and the eyes are different the mind whatever it is now we are entering into a difficult area because modern science doesn't have much idea what the mind is let alone pure consciousness atman all of that let's forget it for the time being yeah, mind as somebody presented me with this very nice collection of articles from MIT MIT press um a study of pure consciousness so experiences of pure consciousness i think 40 50 essays uh, see the very uh, uh, the, the very title itself pure consciousness events the very title itself shows that the misunderstanding of what pure consciousness is you cannot have an experience of pure consciousness consciousness is that which experiences it's not something that is experienced not an object you cannot have a pure consciousness event you know what they mean when they say such things they mean that somebody was meditating or some kind had some kind of was high on drugs or something and then experienced something i felt that was pure consciousness no if you do that if you have an event starts and ends every event starts and ends every event is different from other events according to vedanta or even sankhya pure consciousness is the background for all events you cannot have a pure consciousness event anyway so back to this the mind whatever it is is different from the eyes first observation the mind by itself observes not only the eyes but the ears and the nose and the skin all the sense organs and the rest of the body mind by itself can observe can know 
Mm. No. Objectify, think about, cognize. And then the third observation, the mind remaining what it is, the um, things in the body and the senses and the eyes are changing continuously. You might say the mind is changing very fast, faster than everything else. Yes, but the mind is changing into more mind, thoughts into thoughts into thoughts. So again, the seer is one, the seen are many. The seer is uh, different from the seen and the see, uh, seer is unchanging and the seen are changing continuously. Okay, interesting. Now, let's go deeper. Consider the mind itself. The mind, we know the mind. Yes. Introspect, there's a word introspection. When you look inside yourself, you know, I am happy, you know, we are happy. I am unhappy, you know you are unhappy. You know, you know that you are unhappy. I understand this, or I do not understand this. I remember this, I cannot remember this. Memory, intellect, the workings of all of that, the failure of all of that, are all experienced by us. We know it. Therefore, you are the knower of the mind, you are the seer of the mind, and the mind is seen. Are you with me? Not too many are confident now. <laughs> it's a fact. Just like this body is a fact. The mind is going on thinking, feeling, understanding, remembering, forgetting. It's a fact. Take a look. Take a look. Just now. It's like an internal movie. All of us have it. Except zombies. <laughs> so we, have, uh, we can observe it. You, the knower of the mind. What is, what is you, the knower of the mind? What is it? The verse calls it. Let's give you a name. Sakshi. Witness. In the sense that you are the witness of the mind. The name is given. A label. So you, the knower of the mind, so-called Sakshi, you are different from the mind because seer and seen are different. Third, second, you are one. The mind is many. So many thoughts, emotions, ideas, memories. You are relatively unchanging and the mind is continuously changing. So now you have these three observations. You, the witness of the mind, are different from the mind. You, the witness, you, the witness of the mind, Sakshi, you are um, unchanging, the mind is continuously changing. You, the witness of the mind, you are one. The mind has many, many aspects, thoughts, memories, and so on and so forth. All right. Here itself, we have reached something very interesting. That you are not the body, you are not the mind. Why are you not the body? Because you are the seer of the body. You have to be different from the body. Just as you are not the eyes, you are not the rest of the body either. Because you are the seer. The seer is different from the seen. Knower is different from the known. And you are, likewise, we are not the mind also. Because whatever comes in the mind, it's known by us instantaneously. You can never say, for example, I am very unhappy, but I can't feel it. It's ridiculous. Only when you feel it directly, you can you claim that I am unhappy or happy. Yeah. So, all the activities of the mind are directly presented to you, the consciousness, right now. It's nothing, you know, after a lot of spiritual practice that will happen, I'm not there yet. Everybody's there. Everybody's there. So we, we all experience this now. You're not even the mind. You are one and the witness unchanging, one unchanging witness of the mind, separate from the mind and the body. All of this, I'll come to you. We hold on to your questions till the very end. Remember the questions. All of this we get from that one word. Knows. Yo vetti. If you know it, if you are the subject, if you are the seer, you must be different from the seen, the object. This is the principle. It's worth thinking about. All right. One more question here. You know, it sounds quite extraordinary. I'm not the body and the mind. Never thought about it. Yes, that's the problem. I've never thought about it. But the claim is you're not the body and the mind right now. If I ask you the question, the body is right here. You know, if you look at your body, experience the body. The body is right here. Is it a fact or is it theory? Very few people seem to... Most of, for most of you, the body is a theory. And you, you're, very, you're very elevated souls. The body is a fact. It's a fact. The most obvious fact of our lives. The body is a fact. It's right there. St. Francis used to call it brother ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So the body is there. And uh, do you experience the own, your own body? 
Yes. And therefore, by this logic, what thinking about? You are the experiencer of the body, the knower of the body, and therefore different from the body, not literally the body. And then the same thing, that you have a mind. Is, is, is it true? Is it a fact? Right now, if you uh, introspect, close your eyes and look inwards, try to feel inside, do you have thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, questions? Yes, it's a fact. And are you aware of those facts? You're aware of your own mind. In that case, you are the knower of the mind, the seer of the mind, and therefore you have to be distinct from the mind. This being distinct from the body-mind, right here, in the body-mind, and yet not the body-mind, and being aware of the body-mind, of the functioning of the body-mind, not that when you become distinct from the body-mind, your body-mind will not disappear. It will still be there. It will function as, as usual. But you are aware of a fact which you were not aware of earlier. Now you know a fact which you did not know earlier. This, I am not the body, I am not the mind, is this a fact or a theory? See, the logic compels us to say it's a fact, but we are unable to say it's a fact. <laughs> for us, we'll say, Swami, it's a theory for us. At most, it's an interesting teaching, but I can't claim that I am not the body. <laughs> yes, you have to stay with it. Advaita Vedanta says, why are you hesitant to claim this? Think about it. Is it a, is it a theory or is it a fact? This is the beauty of Advaita Vedanta. He's talking about facts all the way through. This body, yeah, this body, fact, O son of Kunti, is the field. Why he calls it a field? There's discussions. Uh, Shankaracharya gives uh, two or three meanings. One is, Kshetra has multiple meanings. In Sanskrit, Kshetra is connected to Kshaya, Kshayat, that which deteriorates over time, a very pessimistic view of the body. What is the definition of the body? That which ages, deteriorates and dies. That's the definition of the body. <laughs> Yeah, for doctors it makes sense. They're seeing it every day. <laughs> so, yes, there are two views of the human body. One is uh, emergency room view, ICU view. Uh, emergency room or ICU view. Another one is you know, forever 21. <laughs> <laughs> that is wishful thinking. What is ICU emergency room view? You might say it's very negative, but it's a fact. And it's an inevitable fact for all of us. So that's the nature of the body. But good news is you are not that body which is subject to deterioration and uh, destruction. So kshayat, for that reason, because it undergoes deterioration and destruction, that's why it's called kshetra. From the Sanskrit root, uh, kshaya means to deteriorate. Another meaning is field. Kshetra as in field, why? As in the field, whatever seeds you put in, they germinate. This is where all our past karma germinates. I don't know my past lives. How do I know if my past lives are there? What, what was there in my past life? Don't bother. Look at your present life. It will tell you a lot about your past life. <laughs> it will tell us a lot about what kind of person we were. Uh, so, um, it is the field where the, the seeds of past karma germinate. That's why it's called Kshetra. There are commentators. And one commentator I've seen has given 11 meanings of the word field. But we are not interested in that. So this is the field, and I, who am the knower of the field, am Kshetragya, the field knower. And then we use this as a lever to enter into, to separate, to force apart in our understanding, self from not self, atma from anatma. And we have come to this conclusion that until we discriminate, until we discern, until we investigate, we think we are this body-mind-consciousness bundle. We don't deny we are consciousness. We all, we, we feel, of course we are conscious. But we feel we are conscious beings. Consciousness, mind, body, senses, this whole bundle I am. But when we investigate, you cannot be this bundle. If you say, eyes and the world which is seen, forms are seen, eyes are seen. Where am I? There or here? I will say I am here, on the side of the eyes. I am always on the side of the seer. Eyes themselves are seen, eyes, ears, nose, all of this. Then when I'm, where am I? The mind is the seer. Am I the mind or the eyes? I am the mind. I experience. We, look at your own experience. This is the beauty of Advaita Vedanta. No question of believing anything. Take a look and try to understand. What do you feel? Am I the mind or am I the nose? No, I am the mind. I'm aware of the nose. Yes. Then when I look at the mind, thoughts and feelings, the thoughts and feelings come and go. I am not those thoughts and feelings. I am the one who's watching or experiencing those thoughts and feelings. So then I am the experiencer of my own mind. I am the consciousness to which my 
thoughts and feelings to which the thoughts and feelings arise and float around and disappear and thoughts and feelings are just almost it's mental talk just think of a thought a b c d 1 2 3 4 basic thought am i that a b c d no i am the one who's experiencing that a b c d the 1 2 3 4 in the mind so clearly i am not that mental chatter i am the one who's aware of that mental chatter and that krishna doesn't have to tell me i know that for myself what krishna is saying that <coughs> if you get it what krishna has said you will notice you will get a feeling of yeah i mean it's not all that difficult it's pretty basic actually we just don't attend to it we don't notice it it's just making us notice it what good is all this already a lot of good has been accomplished one the if i am not the body the problems of the body are not mine the characteristics of the body are not mine tall short now uh, overweight uh, skinny now by new york you know there's a this anti discrimination law you cannot discriminate on the basis of height and weight so that's good for all the short persons and all the large persons <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> they belong to the body it does not belong to to the to you it's a characteristic of the body uh, race white black brown uh, this is a characteristic of the body even gender is a characteristic of the body you might say no it's mental also all right characteristic of the mind but still not you there's a lot of discussion of course in new york is a hotbed the lgbtq plus discussions and all Now somebody asked me in England, what's your position, Vedantic position? This is Vedantic position is the is the diametric opposite of it. I was thinking, from Vedantic position, gender itself is a delusion. In one sense, it agrees with the LGBTQ plus movement that it's a it's a construct. Yes, even those who say there's only male and female, some people are very conservative about that. Only male and female. Vedanta will say even that's a delusion. So. Vedanta goes the other way, that what we truly are is beyond gender. Its gender is at the body level, at the most, at the at the mental level. That's it. One might say, what else is there? What else? The reality is beyond that. You are beyond body and mind. So, age, gender, race, disease, sick, body, or at most prana, the vital sheath. Not you. You are the knower of that. Pain. it's an important thing pain many people suffer from say chronic pain for example very difficult to manage and many people have to live with more or less little more or little less of that over the years now if you know that all right pain is an object yo vetti the one who knows are you aware of your pain of course that's why i'm so unhappy but if you're aware of the pain you are not in pain you are aware of the pain maybe the body the pain is in the body is literally in the body put things where they belong don't misplace things one swami put it very nicely the vedanta application of vedanta jo jahan ka hai wo hai usko wahi rehne dijiye mahatma ji whatever belongs to where you just put it there oh monk that's vedanta old age belongs to the body not to you pain belongs to the body not to you race gender um, uh, all these things belong to the body not to you not as a matter of rhetoric not as a matter of a, of a slogan as a fact what is the weight of consciousness is consciousness overweight no is consciousness tall or short no is consciousness white or brown no and clearly we are awareness i am the seer so the characteristics of the body they belong to the body they do not belong to you the characteristics of drashta seer will belong to the seer the characteristics of drishya seen will belong to the seen notice all that creates problems for us all that creates samsara both good and evil they belong to drishya object not to you not to you whatever is problematic and also pleasurable and tempting and te- whatever is tempting in the world and whatever is terrifying in the world they are all objects drishya drishya and they belong to objects not to you even the worst of diseases to a person who might be dying in the icu it still belongs to the body or it belongs to the mind 
even feelings negative feelings positive feelings whatever they are in the mind not in you this the uh, experiencer this is a very radically different way of looking at it we started very simple eyes are the seer and the forms are seen everybody knows that we feel like oh go on get a move on but now we are at a place which is very radical just think about it how do you use this practically let me give you an example i heard this from um swami anubhavananda saraswati you know smiling swami some of you know he's going to come here next month i think he's going to come here he's going to give a talk here some of you know know him anubhavananda saraswati is called a smiling swami so he is basically the traditional model of the indian monk who is to go from village to village and uh, who had no home and would stay wherever he was put up with and he would give talks and teachings and then travel to the next village so he's just like that except villages he goes through countries so he is this global globe trotting monk he has no particular place and uh, he goes from country to country city to city across the world and he teaches and is very a very humorous person he puts it very lightly and sweetly but very profound teachings when he had come here last time somebody was serving tea to him and asked so where is your ashram and he said this is my ashram yeah this is it <laughs> here i am anyway how do you apply this seer and seen how do you apply it in your life so i'll quote him what he said he said aap socho aap kahan baithe ho please think notice where are you sitting where are you sitting the swami i'm sitting on a chair yes but what he means is are you sitting in the mind or in the witness consciousness how do we know that here is the thing simple but profound he says notice what's going on are you concerned with the world why is that person saying this that person is against me that person is for me and, and this is terrible that's great this is the world you're concerned with the world you're constantly seeing the world who does this it's the mind's job to watch the world if you are constantly busy with the world you're sitting in the mind if you're more concerned with what your reaction is in the mind then you're sitting in the witness consciousness I'll repeat that. If your attention is what's going on, I know what's going on in the world. The mind is reporting to me. The eyes are reporting, ears are reporting, and the mind is reporting to me. But I am watching what the mind does with this information. Am I getting upset? Am I getting angry, jealous? Am I getting depressed? The movements of the mind are my chief concern. Then you are sitting in the witness consciousness. Beautiful. Very practical. See how it works. Somebody said that. oh um something bad happened and i got upset about it temporarily i said that's good notice what you just said you are not so much involved in that bad thing happening you are more upset because you became upset you know i'm a, i'm a spiritual seeker i meditate i practice vedanta why should my mind get so upset you are watching the mind that's good that's progress If you had just told me it's so awful, why did that thing happen? Why did that person say this? Why did this thing happen? Why did that thing happen? <laughs> Then you are busy with the world. You are sitting in the mind. Don't do that. Step back. And if you are worried about the mind, why did my mind react that way? Already great progress. I am reminded of Swami Abhayanand Ji, Bharat Maharaj, who was a great, very senior monk of our order. So when he was in the Himalayan ashram of Mayavati, established by Swami Vivekananda. a lot of tigers there now they are unfortunately those are gone cheetahs are still there uh, leopards leopards are still there bears also but at that time there were these big tigers those who have uh, read as in children as children jim corbett's tiger hunting stories that's the area champavat almora that area so mayavati is there so one day the swami was walking down one of those narrow mountain paths and a huge tiger crossed from the um shrub the the undergrowth on one side crossed over to the road and turned and looked at him the swami immediately he put his hand inside his coat over his heart to see whether his heart beat increased or not the tiger looked away and then walked off and swami was saved from becoming tiger food but notice what was his first concern am i scared is not concerned about the tiger oh my god the tiger i'm done for no his first concern his real worry is am i worried i should not be worried now that's 
pretty far ahead but uh, that's what i'm talking about you are sitting that person is sitting in the witness consciousness because what he is observing is the mind his attention is on the mind not on the world which the mind is reporting so you are not the body not the mind apply it in this way every time you find yourself in in trouble being you know in the caught in the whirlwind of the world ask yourself where am i sitting as that swami said ab kahan baithe ho socho zara where are you sitting are you sitting in the mind then you will be troubled there's no doubt about it are you sitting in the witness consciousness same events outside you'll be able to deal with it much better especially with this knowledge i am not the body not the mind and neither is anybody else everybody is this witness consciousness and this is just the opening theme step 1 next it becomes even more stunning the next step two questions will come up here one question is that um, in all these bodies and minds you said i am not the body not the mind i am the witness the one who knows this body and mind i am the kshetragya knower of the field so fields are many how many knowers of the field surely many many if there are 8 billion people on the world today there must be 8 billion knowers of the field and how many animals see animals also they are also fields so there are knowers of the field there billions and trillions maybe or is it one this is the question how many knowers of the field are there fields are many there's no doubt you can count so question number 1 how many knowers of the field second question number 2 what about god up to 12th chapter you're talking about god bhagavan ishwara avatar krishna what not you're going on and on and on vishwaroop where is god suddenly disappeared where is god in all this because we have got only two things field and knower of the field everything is the field body and external world also and i am the knower of the field now god has to be one of these things either god is an object a field or god is god is me and we know of the field so these two questions that we will we'll take up in the next verse in half a verse the first sentence of the verse krishna answers both questions how many knowers of the field are there and who is krishna in all of this who is god in all of this we'll see verse number 2 क्षेत्रज्ञं चापि मां विद्धि क्षेत्रज्ञं चापि मां विद्धि सर्वक्षेत्रेषु भारत सर्वक्षेत्रेषु भारत क्षेत्र क्षेत्रज्ञयो ज्ञानं क्षेत्र क्षेत्रज्ञयो ज्ञानं यत्तज्ञानं मतं मम यत्तज्ञानं मतं मम no me to be the knower of the field in all fields kshetragyam chapi mam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharat o bharat o arjuna in all these fields in all these millions of beings billions of beings there is only one knower and i am that he has answered two questions how many knowers of the field are there this pure consciousness we talked about witness consciousness witness sakshi how many one we normally we would we would be led to think and we would not be um, we cannot be blamed for it if we think in each body mind there are many bodies and there are many minds clearly so in behind each body mind there must be a separate um, witness he says no there is only one witness in all bodies and minds and that i am krishna says then what is god in all this he says i am that one witness in all bodies and minds is god krishna says vivekananda said there's only one god that i believe in the sum total of all human souls is the only god that i know and worship so this is one of the concepts of conceptions of god so one consciousness in all of them see what is a sentient being and what is god what is jiva and what is um, ishvara what is jivatma paramatma the sentient being and god in vedanta it is that pure consciousness which you are with the coating of one mind and one body that's called a jiva sentient being it is the same pure consciousness with a coating of all minds and all bodies together this cosmic being which we saw uh, in the 11th chapter vishwaroop darshan so there is one consciousness which identifies with all bodies and minds that is called god ishwar bhagwan another name is virat the vast and that one also identifies in each body and mind as a separate individual being that's called a sentient being that's you and i 
but in it both are the same consciousness it's something difficult to swallow it's a huge huge picture it's a very grand kind of vision of this universe and and what we are so one consciousness in all beings and that one consciousness in all beings is god one consciousness identified with each of those beings is a sentient being the each of us um funny story i've repeated this number of times but this is the right time to repeat that story once again um because this is it pertains to this verse so at one time a few decades ago in the 20th century there was a big debate between the non dualists advaitins and dualists the madhva vedantins the dvaita vedanta in bangalore this happens once in a while rarely these days but used to be a common feature earlier so the challenge was from the dualists to the non dualists and the swami who was the non dualist champion uh, swami kashikananda giri he has passed away a few years ago he used to live in mumbai He's from kerala uh, so he he was a tremendous scholar i never met him i've read some of his books and what i'm saying is based on one of his books um it's called advaita vaijanti mala the g- victorious garland of non duality so he uh, uh, he was a t- great scholar he had a, his title was dwadasha darshana kanana keshari the lion who stalks in the forest of 12 philosophies he was this tiny little man <laughs> but apparently is the lion who stalks in the forest of 12 philosophies what are the 12 philosophies the six orthodox philosophies nyaya vaisheshika sankhya yoga purva mimamsa and vedanta or uttar mimamsa and the this is the six orthodox philosophies astika the six uh, heterodox philosophies nastika what are they charvaka the materialists the jaina philosophy then the four schools of buddhism sautrantika vaibhashika yogachara vigyanavada and shunyavada madhyamaka So the master of these twelve schools is a forest, and in which he stalks in the so. So he was the champion from the Advaitic side, and this debate was held in Bangalore. So this is all from the foreword to his book. Now all went well. On from the Dwaita Vedanta side, there was a great scholar. I forget the name, and um, the debate went well for the first half of the first day. Now the second half it dissolved into chaos. because the supporters of the dualists and non-dualists they were seated on two sides of the aisle they started throwing chairs at each other <laughs> yelling abuse at each other fights and cha- fights broke out and people started throwing chairs at each other so the whole thing dissolved into chaos and uh, the author says later i wrote back to the organizers saying please let me know who won the debate and i did not receive an a reply so i declared myself the victor nowadays you have this i identify as such and such you have to respect my choice i identify as a bird even though i can't fly but you have to respect you have to see me as a bird so is he was like that i identify as the winner of this debate you have to respect me as that <laughs> uh, somebody said i identify as as the as being right all the time so you have to respect that <laughs> i am right in every debate so he said he won the and why am i telling you all this you know what the subject was every such debate there is a text which is debated about and the text was kshetragyam chaapi mam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata this this line the first line that was debated all right a quick little bit of analysis before we uh, shut down for today one consciousness in all beings what does that mean um we think there are many consciousnesses in many beings that's the more natural position and it's the position taken by many philosophies including primarily the sankhya philosophy so there's a great debate between the between shankara between the advaitins and the sankhya philosophy the sankhya philosophy primarily says yes there are many fields many bodies many minds and many consciousnesses there are we are all spiritual beings with the emphasis on the plural beings and yes we are not body we are not mind we are pure spirit pure consciousness and we have to distinguish ourselves from body mind and that's freedom but we are not one we are many and the advaitin says we are one the, the sankhya asks prove it the advaitin says no you prove it why do you think we are many the sankhya says be easy he gives a battery of arguments about five standard arguments are there but they are pretty easy to knock down for example the sankhya philosopher says we cannot be one consciousness because 
um, the birth of one is not the birth of all. The death of one is not the death of all. If I die, everybody doesn't die. But that is very easily answered because birth and death pertain to the body. Uh, one body may be born while another body is dying. Doesn't mean consciousness is born or consciousness dies. According to Sankhya itself, Sankhya doesn't say consciousness is born with the body. Sankhya doesn't say consciousness dies with the body. Okay, the Sankhya says, okay, granted that. But um, we can't all be one being because uh, if one is awake, it doesn't mean all are awake. If one falls asleep, everybody doesn't fall asleep. But thank God, in Vedanta class, if one falls asleep, there's always somebody sleeping. <laughs> and it would be disastrous if everybody went to sleep and some, one person falls asleep. So we can't be all one consciousness. That are, that's also pretty easily answered. Waking, dreaming, sleeping, these are all functions of the mind, not consciousness. According to Vedanta and Sankhya. It is the mind which is awake, which is the mind which falls asleep, it is the mind which dreams, and the mind which awakens again. Consciousness is the witness of all of that. See, the way to distinguish between consciousness and objects, if, it's, if you can say idam, what Krishna used, this, then it's not consciousness, it's an object. Body, can you say this body? Yes. Can you use breath? Can you say this breath? Yes. Feelings. Can you say this feeling I have? Yes, you can say this. Thoughts. Can you say this thought, this memory, this understanding, this concept, this uh, belief? Yes, for all of that you can say this, this, this. Therefore, they are objects. They are not you the way of experiencing consciousness. Idam, this. Therefore, you cannot say that waking and dreaming will prove that there are many different consciousnesses. All right, says the um, Sankhyan. But look, we cannot be one consciousness because if one becomes illumined, everybody doesn't become illumined. If one is in delusion, everybody is not in delusion. If my guru is enlightened, I don't become enlightened, unfortunately. I have to get the same thing in, my, in myself. So I can't be one consciousness with the guru. No, that's also not true. Because knowledge and ignorance, bondage and freedom, these are all in the mind. It's the mind which is ignorant and the mind which has to be educated. Uh, ignorance is the mind, knowledge comes in the mind and solves it, and, uh, removes ignorance. The Atman, pure consciousness is never in ignorance. A cloud comes and seems to obscure the sun. And a gust of wind comes and blows away the cloud. In either case, the sun was not affected at all actually. From the sun's perspective, there's nothing. So, um, knowledge and ignorance do not prove that we are many consciousness. And similarly, these are arguments to show that we cannot be many consciousness. There is no clear argument to show that. Apart from body-mind, apart from body-mind, you cannot make a distinction in consciousness. You know why? There is a logical reason for this. Whatever is not consciousness can be designated as this. All this, all objects, they have features. If there is a feature, you can distinguish one from the other. But if you are distinguishing one from the other, these must be objects. If consciousness has a feature, can you ever objectify it? No. There is no, no, there's no reason, no grounds for saying that consciousness has some characteristics or features or attributes, apart from being existing and conscious, being, and uh, you know, it's existence and light, sat prakasha, being light. But those, those are not attributes, those are what it is actually. Do you see the point? If it, how do you distinguish? You see, the question is, there are many consciousnesses. If there are many consciousnesses, you should be able to distinguish between consciousness one, consciousness two, consciousness three. If you are going to distinguish between them, you should be able to say that they are separate characteristics. Say, I can distinguish between the people present here by your dress and by you know age and uh, names and the position where you are sitting. I can distinguish between all of you. But can you do that for consciousness? You cannot. Because there is no feature by which you can distinguish. Logically, you cannot. If you could distinguish, it would become an object. And everything is an object to consciousness. Consciousness is not an object to anything. That was, in fact, the last part of the Drig Drishya Viveka Shloka, which I did not complete. Drigeva Natu Drishyate. The seer is never seen. Consciousness is never an objectified. Therefore, you cannot distinguish one consciousness from another. And Krishna says, I am that one consciousness in all beings. You are the same one consciousness, but somehow identified with that one body-mind. I am the one consciousness identified with all body-minds, and therefore my name is Ishwara, Bhagavan, God, Saguna Brahman. Alright, so far so good. What have we done? So far we have made this progress. We have separated body-mind 
from the witness consciousness. That was step one. Step two, we have found that the witness consciousness is one in all bodies and minds. So we are now one consciousness in all bodies and minds. Just see the progress of thought. Now what's left? The not-self. This whole un universe is left. Bodies and minds are left. They are all not-self, separated from you. How is it non-duality? How is it non-duality? Even if I say there is one consciousness, fine, suppose there is. But there are many minds and many senses and bodies and billions of inanimate things in this world, from galaxies to um, groundnuts, from quasars to um, you know, uh, amoeba. There's so many things in this world are there. How is it one? All right, it comes the next thing, next big step, which is implied here, will be worked out later, but it will be said here. Now he says, consider this one consciousness in relation to um, the non-conscious, the object. Kshetra Kshetra Gyanur Gyanam, he says, in the second line he says, Kshetra Kshetra Gyanur Gyanam, Yattaj Gyanam Matam Mama. Now consider the field and the knower of the field. What is the field? Everything. What is the knower of the field? Now one consciousness. What is the relationship between them? Is it separate from that consciousness? Here's a subtle point. Think about it. I'm just quoting a teacher uh, whom, from whom I heard it in Hindi. I'll tell you the original and translate. Drashta to drishya se alag hai, so to thik hai Mahatma ji. Lekin aapne kabhi socha hai, drishya kya drashta se alag hai? The seer is separate from the scene. That's correct. That's what we said. But, but, here is the thing. Have you ever considered whether the scene is separate from the seer? What do I mean by that? Eyes are separate from the form. Correct. Eyes are separate from this form. But this form is also separate from the eyes. No doubt. But this pure consciousness and everything that appears to pure consciousness, is it something separate, physically separate from the, uh, or you know, there are entities, separate independent entities interacting. Is it, is it like that? Consider this example, the dream example. You have a dream. You're not aware that you're dreaming, but you're in a dream world. And you have a own, you're, you're yourself there in the, as part of the dream. When you wake up, you the waker, you realize, I was sleeping on this bed and dreaming the whole thing. So I am separate from the dream. The dream has gone, but I am still there. And when the dream was going on, even then I was actually there on the bed and uh, I was lying down and dreaming. I was always separate from the dream. But was the dream separate from me? Did it exist without me? Is it something that exists and then I go into the dream world and experience it? Question. You are separate from the dream. Do you understand how? Because you existed before the dream. During the dream also, you are actually on the bed, not in the dream world. Suppose you are visiting Delhi or something like that. You are not in Delhi. You are in New York. But that dream you had of Delhi... Uh, is it separate from you? Can it, does it actually exist, the dream? No. It was generated by your mind. So the seer is separate from the scene, but the scene is not separate from the seer. This is what he wants to say here in Advaita Vedanta, that this so-called universe, object, field, kshetra, is actually not separate from the knower of the field. Look how interesting it is. We started by separating. Now we are absorbing it back. We started by separating. Why did we separate at all? In order to know the knower of the field as it is. Not as body-mind, but as pure consciousness. Once you have understood what is pure consciousness and the unity, the oneness of pure consciousness, now you look back upon the field and see that it is a projection in, an appearance in, drawing its existence and illumination entirely from the you, the one consciousness. Now those who have studied Advaita Vedanta, just a... Uh, hint to them Shankaracharya's introduction to the Brahma Sutras what is called Adhyasa Bhashya is uh, uh, introduction to the theory of superimposition that's basically this idea he says that uh, the idea of I and this he uses I and you but anyway I and this is as different as light and darkness Tamap Prakashavad Viruddha Swabhav like they are you, the witness consciousness, and the object, subject and object, seer and the scene, they're as different as light and darkness. They shouldn't be able to interact. 
but they do interact. You are pure consciousness, and yet there is a mind and a body and a world which you are interacting with. Question is how? Two physical things can interact. One thought can interact with another thought. But how can uh, something that is entirely different, something is spiritual, something is material, how can they interact? Where will they meet? This is the same problem that Descartes faced when he made the Cartesian duality of mind and body. Then how does mind and body interact? Even now it's not a solved problem. So it shows that there's something wrong in that theory. So here is the answer. It is not that seer and seen are different, where we started off. Seer is different from the seen. You are different from the universe which you experience. But the seen is not different from the seer. The universe is not different from you. There are two kinds of difference. One is this book on the table. Book and table are different. How, how do you know? I can show you the book without the table. I can show you the table without the book. And I can show you both together. This is the way to demonstrate difference. The presence of one in the absence of the other. See, book, no table. See, table, no book. See, book and table together. But suppose I tell you table and wood. Can I show you the table apart from the wood? No. Can I show you the wood apart from the table? Yes. Break the table? Only wood. Before the table was made? Only the wood. Wood exists by itself. And given a certain name and form, it's called a table. Similarly, what exists is this one existence awareness. Pure consciousness, Atman, Brahman, whatever you call it. Kretragya, knower of the field. It projects itself as the field and sees itself as knower of the field. Swami Vivekananda says, one only exists. It appears as nature, soul. Subject, object, seer, seen, knower, known. One only exists. In order to do this, that the whole of this display of the universe is nothing but pure consciousness, you are forced to the conclusion this is universe is an appearance. Jagat Mithya. Now you see the crucial position, the falsity of the world plays in Advaita Vedanta. In order to establish oneness, you are pure consciousness. That much is established. Now what's this? Is it something separate from you? The cause of all your trouble? If it is, you'll have to withdraw from all this. That's why the Sankhyan, the Yogi, they want to sit in uh, Samadhi and blank out the world. Because it's not me and it's real and it's troublesome. I want to sit in existence in, uh, in, in my pure awareness nature and that's it. M my way is meditation. Cut out the world. People, relationships, jobs, good and bad, struggles in the world. No, not that. Only this mountain top, eyes closed. Vivekananda said, he who runs away to meditate and die in a Himalayan cave has missed the way. He who plunges headlong into the vanities and the foolishness and the luxuries of the world has missed the way. If you run away from the world, you have missed the way. If you plunge into the world, you have missed the way. Then what is the way? If you stay in an ashram, you have missed the way. If you stay in Manhattan, you have missed the way. Then what is the way? Where do you stay? <laughs> <laughs> so Vivekananda says, you have to divinize life itself. Wherever you are, whatever you are with, whether in an ashram or in, um, in, the, in the middle of the city, Wherever you are, in the middle of the job, in your meditation room, wherever, it is that same one consciousness. It is appearing in this way here and appearing in that way there. But there, see, here and there, space. Now and then, time. This and that, object. Space, time and object are appearances in one consciousness which you are. This is what Advaita Vedanta wants to say. And Krishna says here, this knowledge of Kshetra and Kshetragya, Yattad Jnanam, this is the ultimate knowledge. This is the knowledge I want to impart in this whole Bhagavad Gita. Now, what we will do in the next two or three classes, I will introduce you to what Shankaracharya says. Shankaracharya has written extensive commentary on this one. There's another one, the, sec the 16th verse of the second chapter, Nasato Vidyate Bhava. So there are these verses which are naughty, not naughty, but K-N-O-T-T-Y. They're in Sanskrit called Granthi. They're like knots. And uh, there's a whole story about it. That uh, when Mahabharata was being dictated by Vyasa to uh, Ganesha, Ganesha said that I will take it down. Huh? There was no AI at that time which would. Huh? So Ganesha said I'll take it down. And he's the only, he's a fit person to write all of that. 
so but ganesha had a condition you have to be careful when the god set a condition they are going to put you in trouble i'll write it down but if you stop dictating i'll put down my pen and that's it i'll not pick it up again and vyasa was no less he said all right uh, agreed but i have a condition too you must first understand whatever i say and then write it so look okay, at done so they start now it's difficult job composing sanskrit verses continuously <laughs> and mahabharata has more than 100000 verses so when vyasa got tired breathless and can't think of anything he would compose a particularly naughty verse k n o t t y but ganesha would go hmm what does that mean and vyasa would draw a breath <sighs> and relax maybe take a coffee break or something while ganesha figured it out and then gan when ganesha said ah i got it good next go ahead now so some of these verses you see in the gita strange verses what is night to the sage is day to the worldly person uh, what is night to the worldly person is daytime to the sage what does that mean the one who sees action in inaction one who sees inaction in action that one really sees what does that mean so you see in all of these verses shankaracharya gives long commentaries and especially the longest one is here so what i'll do is i will dwell on shankara's commentary i'll read out portion just for my benefit and you can listen to it it's good to listen to the original language of shankaracharya and i will raise the issues which he has raised this commentary is very important for understanding non duality advaita vedanta so i'm going to enjoy myself <laughs> <laughs> and you are invited to be part of the fun <laughs> we'll do that for uh, three more classes and then we'll see how it's going and then we'll take it up again uh, when we restart later on um there is one announcement that next tuesday class will not be there i'm going to miami to miami international university as a talk there so the tuesday class will not be there this next tuesday all right then let me do the peace chant we'll take questions om shanti 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 hari om tat sat श्री राम कृष्ण कैन यू गेट अ माइक्रोफोन हियर एंड इफ यू वांट टू गेट द बास्केट आउट आल्सो दैट्स ग्रेट रेज योर हैंड सो आई कैन गिव यू द माइक्रोफोन टेल अस योर नेम एंड आस्क द क्वेश्चन नमस्ते स्वामी जी माय नेम इज आदित्य आई हैव टू क्वेश्चंस यस यू सेड आई नो द थॉट इट्स देयरफॉर आई एम नॉट the mind hmm. right but i i also know that i know the thought yes so which knower am i am i the knower of the thought or the knower that knows that i know the thought yes now there are two ways you say i know the thought what does that mean am i thinking about my thoughts in that case it's just one more thought i can think about my own thoughts why did i think that you know so somebody said why did i get worried why did i get upset so you are now thinking about another thought that's one way of knowing your thoughts but that's not what we are talking about here mm. one is i am aware of the thoughts directly say like a sharp pain comes pain comes like right now i am immediately aware of the pain the pain is presented to me in consciousness now i can think about it i knew that pain that was another that's a thought that also is presented to me in consciousness this direct awareness of objects being presented to me that's what i mean by being the witness of thoughts had mentioned that uh ishwara uh, is the total mind no right? ishwara the uh, or, let me just mention say the basic idea of ishwara in uh, advaita vedanta if you take for example the mandukya view so ishwara is that one pure consciousness which we are but now in addition to that comes the power of maya so the what is called the causal body of ishwara and then comes all minds cosmic minds so that's the mind of ishwara and then comes all this cosmic body that's the body of ishwara just like the pattern is ourselves we have a physical body this one and we have a mind thoughts memories ideas and all that and beyond that what we have is something called the causal body which we are in in deep sleep so ishwara also has a causal body a subtle body and a physical body the physical body of ishwara is this cosmos which we saw in the 11th chapter the virat the subtle body of ishwara in consciousness identified with all minds that's called hiranyagarbha 
and consciousness identified with only maya is called ishvara yeah go ahead right but then it sounds like you're saying that totality or the addition of all individuals is ishvara mm. and that sounds more like vishishta advaita than certainly. advaita certainly so how does that mesh with what we're talking about here yes certainly notice so the totality of uh, all is ishvara ishvara is the cosmos we are the individual ishvara is what is sanskrit called samashti and we are the vyashti but this samashti and vyashti is not what advaita is talking about that's the beauty of it if you stopped here it would be vishishta advaitavad but we don't stop here we say that i am actually not this body not this mind not even the causal body i am pure consciousness ishwar is actually not the physical body not the um, cosmic mind not even maya is that pure consciousness that pure consciousness and i the pure consciousness are one pure consciousness what krishna said just now kshetragyam ma chaapi maam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata he does not say that the the knowers of the bodies and minds in all those fields are parts of me he says i am the knower of all those bodies and minds identity if you say the jivatma is a part of the paramatma the body of the jivatma is part of the body of the paramatma no doubt the mind of the jivatma is part of the body of the uh, m- part of the mind of the paramatma no doubt the causal body of the jivatma is part of the maya of the paramatma no doubt but pure consciousness as such which is paramatma a and pure consciousness as such which is jivatma they are one and the same it's like this if uh, there's a man on broadway playing um uh, playing a uh, you know role of a beggar and he plays a role of an emperor of a king and somebody tells you the king and the beggar are the same what he means says that is actually not a beggar he's actually not a king the actor who's playing both of those roles is literally the same actor so when that actor puts on the dress of a pauper of a beggar and re- reads the lines of a beggar he is called a beggar same actor puts on the dress of a king and reads out the lines of a king is called a king but what what the advaita wants to say is even that kingship and that beggarship or beggarhood what would you call it is they are superimposed they are not ultimately real what is ultimately real is that the actor who is behind both their vishishta advaita won't go there vishishta advaita will end by saying it is one organic unity brahman is the totality of all of this all sentient beings are parts of brahman consider the dream example vishishta advaita will never go to the dream example so the entire cosmos which you had in the dream you went to some place and you saw so many people sky and earth and people and all of that when you wake up will you say all of that was part of me or was imagined by me what will you say imagine imagine by you you don't say in my head there are there are, there are uh, um, rocks and trees and um, uh, sky and earth there are people and animals and no you see the whole thing was imagined by me and that's how the whole thing is one with me yeah. because it's not other than me just as the table is one with the wood yeah. table is one with the wood the entirety of the dream is one with the dreamer but for that you have to say that uh, it's a dream it's an appearance it is no existence apart from um, uh, f- from the underlying reality which is where vishishta advaita won't go vishishta advaita will say that there is an organic unity of all of this that an organic unity is ishvara yeah is that uh, does it make sense from the body mind level vishishta advaita is true but from the consciousness level advaita is true so both are just different ways of looking at it is that you can say that uh, classical advaitins will completely disagree you can't have a body mind way of looking at it <laughs> but the body mind way of looking at it is, is samsara is materialism if you try to investigate what you are the kshetragya you will end up with pure consciousness when krishna is telling you i am the one pure consciousness in all beings you come immediately come to an identity between yourself and ishvara in vishishta advaita it will be a part whole relationship um what is called amsha amshi or shesha sheshi bhava uh, part of the cosmic whole is all of us we are tiny parts like upanishad says a vast bonfire and from that thousands of sparks emanate so there's a vast bonfire which is ishvara narayana and from that thousands of millions and billions of sparks are emanating that is vishishta advaita if you interpret in that way yeah um the lady there 
Somebody else here raised their hand. Yes, I will come to you. Hi, Swami. Uh, so when Tell us your name and ask the question. I'm Priya. Hmm. Um, so when we speak of enlightenment, what exactly is getting enlightened? Is it the subtle body realizing the Atman? or? Yes. So the realization comes that I am the Atman, Aham Brahmasmi. And the realization comes in the subtle body, in the mind. And it removes the ignorance in the mind. The ignorance in the mind till now told me that I am this body mind. And the ignorance goes away and it's like the cloud being blown away and the sun, which was always shining, is now revealed in its full glory. You realize, no, I am not this body. I am not this mind. I am pure consciousness. We did the analysis here. But still, you know, if you are honest, it still sounds a little theoretical. If it, Although Shankaracharya here claims it must be seen as absolute fact, just as like the fact I am sitting here on the chair. It should be seen as that fact. Then you are enlightened. If you are, if you are the clear knowledge, indisputable knowledge, I am Brahman, I am this limitless consciousness, not body, not mind. Mind, body, world are appearances in me. They are nothing different from me. They are my appearances. That is enlightenment. The Brahman with attributes. No, no. Only the Brahman with attributes is God. Brahman, Saguna Brahman with attributes is God. Who attributes means, uh, Brahman with attributes would mean Saguna Brahman. Attributes like omniscience, omnipotence, uh, omnipresence. All powerful, all pervasive. What do you you realize yourself as? You realize yourself as pure consciousness. So then, what is beyond the conception of the mind? Pure consciousness. That which to which the mind is appearing. Right now, if it is at all true that you are the witness of the mind, then what is that witness, which is experiencing the mind? That's what's beyond the mind. That's the beauty of it. See something like Vishishta Dvaita or Dvaita dualistic or schools. They talk about Narayana, Vishnu. But notice, they are all faith-based. That there is one organic unity in the universe. How do you know? Yeah, you know? It's told to us by the holy books, by our sages. Are you experiencing it now? No. But this body, I am the knower of this body, everybody is experiencing. And Krishna says, that's enough to start your Vedantic inquiry. And take you all the way. That's the beauty of it. This lady here. Yes, can you pass the microphone? We'll take a couple of more questions and there'll be enough time for these questions again because this is the topic we're stopping with and we're going to go deep into it. Shankara will raise many, many questions which are, we'll often find are in your mind and many that we could have never thought of. He'll raise those questions and answer. Yes. Tell us your name and ask. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sakshi. Uh, Good. <laughs> You're the right person for this class. <laughs> Sakshi, the witness. Yes. Um, my uh, question is regarding uh, the in the context of uh, Panch Koshas. So I was wondering that if the witness consciousness is closer to the Anandamaya Kosh or like the bliss sheath of the five Koshas. True. It's not that the witness consciousness is closer to the Anandamaya. The Anandamaya is closer to the witness consciousness. Closer in what sense? It is uh, subtler than everything else. The Anandamaya is subtler than the, the um, Vijnanamaya. The Vijnanamaya is subtler than the Manomaya. Manomaya is subtler than Pranamaya. Pranamaya is subtler than Andamaya. And subtler than the subtlest is the Sakshi, witness consciousness. However, uh, it's like, you know, in, that's also a way of analysis. That's not the final truth. The final truth is more like this. If somebody tells you, here is the ocean. And it has composed of many waves which are coming up and going down all the time. But I'm telling you the reality of all these waves and reality of all this ocean is something called water. Oh, how do I know the water? Well, take one wave and then, then dive deep into it. At the center of the wave, you will find something called water. Now, once you have got it, but is it actually true? Because the center of the wave is water, the top is water, the bottom is water, the sides are water. In fact, all the other waves are also water. In fact, the whole, whole ocean is only water. Nothing but water there. And of course, salt and other things are there. Mm -hmm. And the fishes will be saying, what about us? What about us? <laughs> so, that way. It is not that the, really speaking, it's not that the um, Anandamaya is closest to Sakshi. That's a good way of doing vichara inquiry. Because you must turn your mind inwards. First, settle on the body. Be aware of the body. Then on the breath, Pranamaya. Then on the thoughts, feelings, Manomaya. Then on your intellect, understanding. Then on the blankness beyond the intellect, Anandamaya. Then to that which is observing all of that. That one you cannot 
uh, focus on that. You cannot uh, objectify it. What will happen is, service in Sanskrit, Savishaya mana will become Nirvishaya mana. The mind will drop all the attributes. And you remain as the witness of that attributeless mind. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Not blank mind. Blank mind will go to sleep. Very alert, uh, awake mind. But not focused on any attribute at all. When you see that I am the witness. But that witness is equally there in the physical world, in the um, pranic world, in the mental world. It's there everywhere. You will notice that it's actually not far. It is the only thing that is there. That's what Advaita finally says. That's the next step. What you're talking about is first step. In the three main methods, Drik Drishya Viveka, seer and seen, distinction. Pancha Kosha Viveka, the method of the five sheets which she is talking about. Avastatra, most powerful, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. So in Vedanta, in, in Himalayas, the monks will have, this one sentence, they'll put all of it. They'll say, um, Drishya Se Vilakshan Drashta, Pancha Kosha Sakshi, Avastatra Sakshi. Panchakosh Vilakshan, Avastatra Sakshi Atma. The witness, which is the witness of all the seen, the seer of all, see, all that is seen. The witness of the five sheets. The witness of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. The same witness which you are. That's step one. And then absorbing it all back into oneness, non-duality. So step one still leaves you with duality. All right. The gentleman there, the young man here, you he can give. Raise your hand. Yeah. Thank you, Swamiji. It was a nice class. Uh, Tell us your uh, name. I'm Ritesh. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, where you mentioned one consciousness is not different from the other. Uh, but uh, when we uh, come to this uh, life, we take our impressions with us in our consciousness. So how do we explain that from an Yes, so perspective? let me just stop you there. We do not take it in our consciousness. Notice the procedure which we did. It's just like a surgical procedure in, in the first verse. Separating the self from the not self. We separated consciousness from everything else, including mind also. So when you say impressions in consciousness, no, no, no. All impressions are in the mind. So when we die, when the physical body dies, then what happens? The subtle body, sukshma sharira, it continues. With the reflection of consciousness in it called Chidabhasa. That is the one which goes to other worlds, which is reborn again as another being and it carries the impressions. Those subtle bodies are all different from each other and the impressions are all different from each other. The witness consciousness is the same. It's not that the consciousness has the uh, seeds of impressions. We use word consciousness in English in a very general sense. Here it's being used in a very precise sense. Distinguished from the mind thoroughly. You have to thoroughly flush out the mind from consciousness. All right, I'll end with this. I will not take any more questions. Swami Brahmananda, he's talking about, he is talking about the importance of samadhi. He says, imagine there's a pot full of water and then you empty out the water and take a look. You will see space. And then he says, but the space was there all along. Even when the water was there. It's only because the water is there, our attention goes to the water and not the space which, uh, uh, which it occupies. You empty out the water, the space becomes evident. And then he says, this emptying out the water, emptying, settling the mind, yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodha, this is samadhi. And then the underlying witness consciousness becomes evident then. If it is not emptied out, then our attention will always be on the contents. Of that, what is appearing to consciousness, not consciousness itself, is giving the importance of samadhi. And then he adds something rather cryptically. He says, vichare, which what we are doing here is vichar, the way of inquiry. He says, by the way of inquiry, without attaining samadhi, without the, he says, by the way of inquiry alone, one can catch a glimpse of this. But to do it thoroughly, one needs samadhi. So, if you do it properly, the inquiry, if it, if it becomes clear to you, what is being talked about, you will get a, catch a glimpse of the of your real nature. And that much is achievable for everybody. Little difficult, not very difficult. I've already done the peace chant. Yes. All right. Next time we'll dive into, take a dive into Shankaracharya's commentary. <laughs>